Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. So uh, welcome to the second episode of the AI Talks. And today we are very happy to invite uh, Yu Zheyang, who is from MIT. And uh, so Yu Zhe is a PhD student in, in MIT and he has uh, he received his bachelor's degree from Peking University, a very top university in China, right? And his research interests uh, include machine learning and AI for healthcare. And he has published at top journals and conferences like Nature Medicine, Science, Translational Medicine, ICML, and iClear. So in today's talk, uh, Yu Zhe will share his latest research on how to use AI to diagnose and assess Parkinson's disease from three perspectives, which are challenges, algorithms, and applications. Uh, so you, just, uh, you can feel free to start whenever you are ready. Okay, sure. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction, Kyle. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, you can hear me, right? Okay. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm extremely happy to be here to share my latest research on machine learning and healthcare. And um, specifically, I will talk about uh, how to design machine learning algorithms that work in the wild against data bias and distribution shift, as well as building AI models that enable new biomarker for diagnose and assess Parkinson's disease. So a little bit background about myself, in addition to Kayan's wonderful introduction, I'm currently a fifth year PhD student at MIT. My main research is on robust and generalizable machine learning and translate these learning algorithms to enable real world digital health and medicine applications. Previously, I graduated from Peking University and also spent time at Google Health Research. So the outline of this talk would be focusing on using AI to advance health applications in the wild. I will talk about two main topics, um, applications and algorithms that achieve this goal. The main story would be centered around a real world AI model design on an important health application, discovering biomarker for Parkinson's disease. And along this direction, I will also discuss the main challenges in machine learning algorithms design and main breakthroughs we achieve to enable this application. The first challenge we tackle is how to deal with data imbalance with continuous targets. The second one we encounter is how to model data from multiple domains, which motivates the need to learn from multiple domain imbalance data and tackling the domain gaps and achieving domain generalization under both data and label sheets. Okay, so to motivate things, let me start with some famous people you might have heard about. Muhammad Ali, the most famous and beloved boxer. Michael J. Fox, one of the most well-known TV show and movie star. Brian Grant, a famous professional basketball player at NBA and Michael and Ozzy, who are the one of the most talented people in their field as NASA astronaut and rock star respectively. So what do they have in common? Of course, they're all famous and probably rich, but what I'm gonna tell you is they're all diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And of course, they're just a very small portion of the people who have Parkinson's disease or PD in short. So what is PD? PD is the fastest growing neurological disease in the world and the second most common neurological disorder just after Alzheimer's disease. Over 1 million people in the United States and 10 million people worldwide are living with PD as of 2020. This results in the economic burden of $52 billion per year. Unfortunately, so far, no drugs can reverse or stop the progression caused by the disease. As a progressive disorder, Parkinson's often begins with subtle symptoms such as slight hand tremor. It affects the nerve system and eventually leads to uncontrollable movements such as shaking, stiffness while walking, and balance issues. 
over time, speech can become slurred and facial, exper uh, facial expressions fade away. So a key difficulty in PD drug development and disease management is the lack of effective diagnostic biomarkers. The disease is typically diagnosed based on the clinical symptoms related to mainly the motor functions, such as the tremor and rigidity. However, motor symptoms tend to appear several years after the disease onset, which leads to late diagnosis. Often by the time when, when the motor symptoms of the disease first emerge and the diagnosis is made, such as the highlighted region in this picture, the disease has already been developed for tens of years and a large percentage of the dopamine producing neurons targeted by the disease have already died off. Therefore, there is a strong need for new diagnostic biomarkers, particularly ones that can detect the disease at an early stage. Additionally, over the last years, researchers have studied cerebrospinal fluid, the neuroimaging test, and the blood biochemical test as potential method to detect Parkinson's. However, such approaches are invasive, expensive, and require access to specialized medical centers, hampering the regular testing that could lead to an early disease detection or continuous monitoring of its progression. Also, in addition to just diagnosing PD, there are also a strong need to determine the severity of PD, as well as tracking its progression over time. Tracking the status and the severity of the disease is important, as in different stages, clinicians would use different medications and therapies for personalized treatment. However, today, the assessment of PD progression relies on patient self-reporting or, qualit or qualitative rating by a clinician. Typically, clinicians use a questionnaire called MDS slash UPDRS. This MDS UPDRS is semi-subjective and does not have enough sensitivity to capture small changes in the patient's status. And as a result, PD clinical trials lead to last several years before changes in MDS UPDRS can be reported with sufficient statistical confidence, which increases cost and delays progress. Therefore, effective progression biomarkers for tracking the severity of the disease over time is also of great demand. Okay, so far we know that there are two key challenges in PD. The first one is how to diagnose it effectively and also in an early stage. And the second one is how to quantify the severity in an objective and easy way that can also be repeatedly measured over time. Fortunately, there are already some evidence showing that low motor symptoms might be indicative of early PD diagnosis. A relationship between PD and breathing was noted as early as 1817 in the first work when PD was observed. Over the years, this link was further strengthened in later work, including works that reported degeneration in areas in the brainstem that control breathing, the weakness of respiratory muscle function, and the sleep breathing disorders in PD. And interestingly, clinicians have observed that these respiratory symptoms often manifest years before the actual clinical motor symptoms, which indicates that breathing and sleep could be promising for risk assessment before clinical diagnosis. So motivated by this evidence, in this work, we seek to use machine learning or artificial intelligence to develop such a diagnosis and progression biomarker for PD using nocturnal breathing signals. So we all have seen tremendous progress of machine learning recently from um, things like uh, GPT-3 to machine translation systems to models that can classify images extremely well 
and um, to systems that can generate realistic images just from text. So to design our biomarker, since human breathing and sleep are in nature complex and high dimensional, so we just seek to design a machine learning system or AI-based system for PD diagnosis and assessment. Specifically, our AI model first extracts nocturnal breathing signals either from a breathing belt worn by the subject or from radio signals that bounce off their body while asleep. By either of these two procedures, we obtain a full night of breathing signals from the subject of interest. It then processes the breathing signals using a customized neural network and infers whether the person has PD and if, and if they do have the PD, assess the severity of their PD in accordance with the MDS UPRS mentioned as the questionnaire before. So this seems to be pretty straightforward, but how to design such an AI model? In fact, there are multiple challenges when designing such an AI model. First, record that the model takes in the full night breathing signal and output whether the person has PD or not. The input nocturnal breathing is usually high dimensional with tens of hours. Whereas the output signal that whether the person has PD or not, and sometimes we also need to assess the severity score of PD, are uh, very sparse. The output almost contains only one bit of information, which is inferred from a very high dimensional and dense input. Such sparse supervision naturally becomes a challenge as the network would easily overfit to the training samples by finding certain spurious correlation in the very dense inputs while learning nothing related to the Parkinson's disease at all. Therefore, to tackle this sparse supervision problem, we first leverage multitask learning to enforce the model to learn PD-related information. Given the nocturnal breathing X, we forward it into a breathing encoder E to extract intermediate features. It then goes through another encoder to further condense the PD feature. And finally, we have two branches for the diagnosis and severity prediction, respectively. We call the PD assessment module as the main task we are interested in. However, due to the sparse supervision we discussed, only use such a network architecture will not prevent potential overfitting. Therefore, motivated by the relationship of the Parkinson's disease and the human's brain activity, we propose to add another EEG predictor to predict the brain EEG activity from breathing signals. This translates to a multitask learning framework where the EEG prediction serves as an auxiliary task. Specifically, the EEG predictor app decodes the intermediate breathing features back to a high dimensional EEG activity throughout the night. Since certain data that we use do have the synchronized brain EEG ground truth, this makes the network benefit from the dense supervision from the EEG signals and enforce and regularize the model to learn um, PD related information. Okay, so using a multitask learning architecture would effectively guide the network to learn the data better. But what about the data itself? Let's look at the data sets used in this study. We both collect sleep breathing data from sleep labs and at home using a wireless sensor. One interesting thing to note is that the data are from multiple distinct hospitals or institutions. Since the data collection setup and the patient population visiting those medical centers can vary a lot across different institutions, although the data collected are still breathing signals, different institutions effectively act as different domains. Moreover, as we can obtain breathing signals by using both breathing belt or wireless sensing devices, the different data modalities further act as different domains 
as there could be potential domain gap between signals that are collected using different approaches. And finally, when zooming into the actual number of subjects in each institution, we can clearly observe that there exists significant data imbalance, both within a single institution, as well as across different domains. So the second challenge is how to deal with the multi-domain data imbalance, as well as generalizing to unseen domains or institutions. To study this problem in depth, we abstract it as a machine learning problem called multi-domain long-tailed recognition, MDLT in short. In particular, past works study the data imbalance problem when the input data all have the same distribution. However, data for the same task can originate from multiple distinct domains, such as here, we can obtain data from the second hospital and even more hospitals. Furthermore, when the model development is finished, we hope the model to also work on data from an unseen hospital, regardless of what its label distribution is. So the goal to learn from multi-domain imbalance data, so, so basically the goal is to learn from multi-domain imbalance data and generalize to all domains and all classes. But what are the key differences when extending the imbalance problem to multiple domains? First, given the multi-domain imbalance data set, by definition, we have both in-domain data imbalance as well as divergent label distributions across domains. This is because the label imbalance can be totally different across different domains. Moreover, when talking about data from multiple domains, we naturally need to tackle the inherent gaps and data shifts across domains. Finally, as we have discussed, certain domains may have no data at all for certain classes. And we also need to generalize to unseen domains. This renders the third challenge that we need zero shot generalization within and across domains. So given these challenges, how should we model the MDLT problem? We first propose the domain class transferability graph for MDLT modeling. In particular, recall that in the single domain scenario, the basic unit we care about is a class where we can have uh, like majority classes or minority classes. However, in MDLT, such basic unit naturally translates to a domain class pair. Based on this domain class pair definition, we can further define the transferability between two domain class pairs, which equals to the distance of their learned features in the high dimensional space. Specifically, for multi-domain dataset, we can get the intermediate features of all domain class pairs and calculate the distance between each of the two pairs, which results in a full transferability matrix as shown here. And one can conveniently visualize the transferability matrix by projecting it into a 2D space. Here, we can clearly see different domains, different classes, as well as the distances between different domain class pairs. The size of the circle corresponds to the number of training samples in the original dataset. We can further compress the transferability graph into only three statistics, namely the transferability of different domains by the same class, same domain by different classes, and different domains and different classes. And visually, the transferability, the transferability statistics looks like this. Okay, so having set up the stage, we make important observations corresponding to the previous definitions. We first train a Valina ResNet 50 model on a two domain digit datasets and vary the label distributions of these two domains and plot the learned transferability graph. Interestingly, when the labels are balanced and identical across two domains, 
the model can easily learn good representations with high accuracy, where different classes are well aligned across domains. When we further make the label distributions to be long-tailed, but still identical across two domains, we can see that the representation learned are still aligned for majority domain class pairs, but not for minority ones. This means that data imbalance can have influence on multi-domain learning problem. Furthermore, when we make the label distributions to be both divergent and imbalanced, the features learned are no longer transferable with a clear domain gap here and the worst test accuracy achieved. So this intriguing observation indicates that divergent label distributions across domains could hamper transferable features. And transferable features are actually needed for good performance in MDLT. And furthermore, we can take a close look at how transferability statistics influence the generalization. We again train several ERM models using different hyperparameter setups and plot the test accuracy against this beta plus gamma minus alpha quantity. We then vary the label distributions for the two domains, including both uniform, both long-tailed but identical, and both long-tailed but divergent. Interestingly, across different label distribution setups, we can clearly observe a strong correlation between test accuracy and this beta plus gamma minus alpha quantity. So this strong correlation indicates that transferability statistics actually characterize the model performance in MDLT. Therefore, we propose a theoretically principled loss function for MDLT that bonds the transferability statistics. Recall that the alpha, beta, gamma statistics govern the success in MDLT. And in particular, smaller alpha and larger beta and gamma would lead to better performance. So here we start with a first approach, which directly optimizes the desired form of alpha, beta, and gamma. Intuitively, this LDA loss is good because the, numer the numerator here represents the positive cross-domain pairs, which corresponds to alpha, and the denominator here represents the negative cross-class pairs which corresponds to beta and gamma. So by definition, optimize this loss would tackle the label divergence problem as the beta plus gamma minus alpha quantity is positively correlated with the performance. However, because this loss is independent of the number of samples in each domain class pair, it does not address the label imbalance problem the loss will still be dominated by the majority domain class pairs. So to further, to further address the cross-domain label imbalance issue, we propose the BODA loss by substituting the original distance function with a so-called balanced distance, which divides the original distance by a factor of the number of samples within each domain class pair. And by doing so, we can prove that the BODA loss upper bounds the transferability statistics in the desired form. And this desired form naturally translates to a better MDLT performance. So to first test the BODA loss, as well as providing a benchmark for the multi-domain long tail recognition problem, we set up the MDLT benchmark, which includes three synthetic as well as five real MDLT datasets and more than 20 algorithms that from different categories, in, including domain, ad, domain adaptation, domain generalization, imbalanced learning, and so on. And our results show that ODA can consistently outperform the baseline by a, by a notable margin and test it to be pretty useful and robust in learning multi-domain imbalance dataset. We further visualize the learned transferability graph for BODA and find that it can learn robust representations 
even under both divergent and imbalanced label distributions across domains. And taking a step further, we would also want the algorithm to be generalizable to unseen domains. And this problem is well known as domain generalization and DG in short. We observe that data imbalance is an intrinsic problem also in DG as learning domains naturally differ in their label distributions. And the label distributions can also be very imbalanced within each, within each of the domain. Therefore, we directly test BODA on DG benchmarks and find that it can also boost the performance in DG setting, improving the results by a notable margin. The improvements are particularly large for the datasets where label distributions are more divergent, such as the Terra Inc. dataset. Therefore, a takeaway message is that label imbalance can affect out of distribution generalization and it is crucial for robust DG algorithm design. Okay, so far by introducing the transferability graph modeling as well as the BODA loss, we can tackle the data bias problem introduced by the multi-domain data and the inherent imbalance between uh, and the inherent data imbalance in the PD classification problem. However, recall that in addition to the binary classification problem, we are also interested in predicting the PD severity score, which is a continuous variable that identifies the disease stage of the patient. So let's take a closer look at the severity score distribution. Here, the y-axis is the number of nights and the x-axis is the severity score. For scores that are under 10, they are usually recognized as normal control subjects. And when the score is larger than 15, with a higher score, the more severe the Parkinson's disease is. Clearly, we can see that the severity score is significantly imbalanced distributed over the whole target range and the target is continuously distributed across the spectrum. This phenomenon presents the third challenge, which differs from the class imbalance problem, is the continuous data imbalance problem. In fact, many real world tasks can involve continuous and sometimes even infinite target values, which corresponds to the regression problem. For example, in vision applications, one often needs to infer the age of different people based on their visual appearance. Here, age is a continuous target and can be highly imbalanced across the target range. In particular, it is often very hard to collect images for the very young and very old people. Similar issues also happen in medical applications where we, where we would like to infer different health metrics across the patient populations such as heart rate, blood pressure, and oxygen saturation. These physiological matrix are also continuous and often have skewed distributions across patient populations. So why is regression different for imbalanced data? Let's start with some intuitive examples. First, consider this imbalanced data set. Here, the X axis is the continuous target which is the age of the people. And the y-axis is the number of samples for each age. Further, let's zoom in on two target labels, H1 and H2. Both of them have equal number of observations in the training data. However, given the density distribution of this imbalanced data set, we know that H1 is in a highly representative neighborhood where there are many samples in its neighborhood range. In contrast, H2 is in a weakly representative neighborhood. In this case, H1 does not suffer from the same level of imbalance as H2. Therefore, the first difference is that equal number of samples does not mean equal balancedness in imbalance regression. This is because of the dependence between data samples at nearby labels. In addition, Different from classification problems, in imbalance regression, certain target values 
may have no data at all. This challenge also motivates the need for target extrapolation and interpolation for those regions without any data. This confirms another difference that because of the continuity of the targets, it implies the potential for target extrapolation and interpolation. So given these differences, how should we perform imbalance regression? The first solution we propose called label distribution smoothing, LDS in short, which used kernel density estimation to learn the effective imbalance in datasets that corresponds to continuous targets. So given an imbalance regression dataset, we argue that the empirical label density does not capture the real imbalance. To further verify this, we show that the error distribution of a ResNet-50 model trained on this data. It turns out that the error does not correlate with the empirical label density. Specifically, the test error as a function of class index has a low negative Pearson correlation with the label density distribution. Note that for regions without any data, the errors could still be very small. This again confirms the intuition that equal number of samples does not mean equal balancedness in this imbalance regression problem. Therefore, to capture the real imbalance as seen by the model, LDS leverages the idea from kernel density estimation. It convolves a symmetric kernel with the empirical label density distribution, and this process gives us a kernel smooth label density, which accounts for the overlap in the information of data samples of nearby targets. And then the resulting effective label density distribution turns out to correlate well with the error distribution now. This demonstrates that LDS captures the real imbalance that affects regression problems. Now that when the effective label density is available, techniques for addressing class imbalance problems can be directly adapted to the imbalance regression context. For example, a straightforward adaptation can be the cost-sensitive reweighting method, where we reweight the loss function by multiplying it by the inverse of the LDS estimated label density for each target. Okay, so moving on, we have demonstrated that the continuity in the label space is important. We are further motivated by the intuition that the continuity in the target space should create a corresponding continuity in the feature space. That is, the feature statistics corresponding to the nearby targets should be close to each other. And inspired by this, we propose the second solution called feature distribution smoothing, FDS. So before introducing FDS, we first use an illustrative example to highlight the impact of data imbalance on feature statistics. We use a plain model trained on the images in the real world age dataset to infer a person's age from his visual appearance. We focus on the learned feature space and visualize the feature statistics for age zero. In particular, we visualize the similarity between feature statistics. Naturally, when talking about feature statistics, we focus on the mean and the variance of the feature. Here, the upper figure shows the cosine similarity of the feature mean, and the lower figure shows the similarity of feature variance. The red bar here is the anchor target which in this case is H0. The blue bar for a specific target refers to the similarity score between that target and the anchor. We also mark the regions with different data densities using different colors. Here, purple refers to many short region, yellow refers to the medium short region, and pink refers to the few short one. So interestingly, the figure clearly shows the problem with regions that have very few data samples, like the H0 we are interested in. Ideally, one would expect that the feature of H0 would only have very high similarity with its nearby ages, such as H1 and H2, and this similarity score should gradually decrease as the age increases. However, here, 
the mean and variance for age zero are showing actually very high similarity to age 40 and 60, which is not expected. This unjustified similarity is due to data imbalance. Specifically, since there are not enough images for age zero, this range thus inherits its priors from the range with the maximum amount of data. And this corresponds to the many short region, which is a range around age 40. Therefore, feature distribution smoothing aims to smooth the feature space using the same idea as how we do in the label space. Basically, we want to transfer the feature statistics between the nearby targets. Specifically, we have a model that maps the input data to the continuous predictions. Now, FDS is performed by first estimating the statistics of each target beam. Without loss of generality, we substitute the variance with the covariance to reflect also the relationship between the feature elements within zeta, which is the feature vector here. So given the feature statistics, we employ an, again, a symmetric kernel K to smooth the distribution of the feature mean and covariance over the target beams. And this results in a smooth version of the statistics. Now, with both the estimated and smooth statistics, we then follow the standard whitening and recoloring procedure to calibrate the feature representation for each input example. And the whole pipeline of FDS is integrated into deep networks by inserting a feature calibration layer after the final feature map. Finally, to obtain more stable and accurate estimations of the feature statistics during training, we employ a momentum update of the running statistics across each epoch. And uh, I also want to highlight that FDS can be integrated with any neural network model, as well as any past work on improving label imbalance. So after incorporating FDS into the model, now let's go back to the previous example and see how FDS influences the feature statistics. By comparing these two figures, we can verify that the feature statistics are well calibrated and in particular, for H0 group, it shows high similarity only in its neighborhood and it, and it exhibits a gradually decreasing similarity score as the target value becomes larger. And similar to MDLT, we have also created the DRR benchmark for rigorous imbalance regression evaluation. This includes three datasets in computer vision tasks, one in an, one in the NLP domain and one in the healthcare domain. We have also performed extensive experiments for LDS and FDS to validate their effectiveness. Okay, so far we have successfully dissected the AI model design and recall that we want an AI model that enables the disease diagnosis, severity prediction and progression tracking from breathing signals. And this AI model is built by using multitask learning to avoid overfitting, multimodal long tail recognition to tackle the, late, the data imbalance and multi-domain learning. And finally, the imbalance regression for dealing with continuous data imbalance. Now we are ready to integrate the AI system for real world deployment and data collection. Since the technology for collecting breathing signals are pretty mature. The participant can either wear a breathing belt or install a wireless device in their, in their own home for sensing the nocturnal breathing signals. And with our AI model and customized algorithms, we can achieve good performance for both data types with an average AUC of 90%. Moreover, since for each individual, we can collect multiple nights of data by voting over multiple nights, we can even achieve a 100% diagnosis accuracy over both control and PD subjects that have multiple nights available in our study. We also test the model performance when the testing distribution is different from the training, namely the domain generalization setting. 
The results show that even when testing on an unseen institution's data, the performance is still good with a 85% accuracy or AUC on average. And our system is also able to detect the severity of PD with a high accuracy. Compared to two gold standard metrics in the PD field, one is the continuous MDS UPDRS score for the left figure, and another is the discrete H and Y stage for the, for the right side figure. Our model prediction is highly correlated with both of the gold standard. And the model also shows initial evidence for early diagnosis. In our dataset, we identify a group of patients who were diagnosed with PD later, but were not diagnosed six years before. And even though they were not diagnosed, they are likely to already have PD onset at that time. So we directly test our model on this data and found that the model is able to distinguish this high-risk prodromal PD group with age and gender match controls with high statistical significance. And finally, since our system can be deployed in the person's own home, we can continuously analyze the breathing data every night and track the severity over time to show the progression of the disease. We first show that our model is able to track meaningful disease severity changes over a relatively short time intervals compared to the clinician assessment. And moreover, since we can measure the breathing every day, we can even track the disease progression in a very fine-grained manner. Here in the right side, the yellow bar is the gold standard PD questionnaire, which is done three times a year and with potentially very high variance. In contrast, our model can provide a robust and more frequent assessment at home, which is desired and more meaningful. So to conclude my talk, we have proposed a new AI-driven health application that detect and assess Parkinson's disease using machine learning. Together, we also identify and propose two practical um, machine learning problems called deep imbalance regression and multi-domain long tail recognition, as well as novel algorithms to address these real world problems. And looking beyond, I believe we still need more robust and generalizable learning algorithms that can work in the wild to support more real world healthcare and other challenging problems and tasks. And thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Hi, uh, so uh, thank you Yuzhe, for giving this such a wonderful talk. And I, I particularly like the those uh, observations you, you've, you, you, have, uh, you have found during the experiments and, and use that to develop the algorithms. So, so now we are entering into the Q&A session where you can, uh, the audience can ask any questions related to this talk or you have any more, uh, you have more, uh, you have some questions of regarding the broader areas in these uh, topics uh, covered in this talk. So there are two ways you can ask questions. The first is you can uh, raise your hands by uh, clicking the raise hand button, or you can uh, type questions in the chat room if you are uh, in an inconvenient place. So, so yes, uh, feel free to ask any questions from the audience. Yeah, uh, yeah, I've seen you raising hand. Let me check how to, uh, yeah. Okay, Guangzhong, I've uh, unmuted you. You can uh, speak up. Okay. Uh, hi, Yijia. Uh, this is Guangzhong. I have a question about the uh, feature distribution smoothing. Uh, 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 as you sure. know, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure how do you choose the the uh, which layer you you do the feature dis distribution smoothing? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Gongcong. Um. So for the feature distribution smoothing, 
uh, in the experiment, we mainly used uh, the last layer before the final linear regression layer. So basically this is the, the, the last feature, feature layer before the regression head. So we use this layer uh, to perform the feature distribution smooth. And uh, we find that this empirically leads to good performance already. And I believe you can also do this in any of the layer in the deep networks. Yeah, I hope this answers your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, 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 have you ever tried to uh, apply this idea to different layers? Yeah, I think that's a good question, yeah. So empirically, we, we tried to apply these techniques to the last two or three layers, and we find that the improvements at least from our experimentation are similar to, to that when we just apply to the last feature layer. So for the computational uh, efficiency, we just choose the last layer. Um, but definitely, I believe probably for some other applications, we didn't test probably using like multiple different feature layers would be better, yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, I have another question about the uh, imbalance regression. Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I'm not sure uh, if any uh, reference uh, 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 about the noisy data points in the uh, uh, imbalance regression problem. Uh, I think uh, if if there are some noisy data points in the uh, this question uh, imbalance regression, it will be very uh, sensitive. Uh, I see. Yeah. yeah. So your question is, uh, what about when the the labels are noisy in the imbalance regression problem? Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah. This is a very good question. So um, unfortunately, I haven't tested this scenario uh, for now, so I I don't have a concrete answer, but. Uh, just to answer your question, yes, um, because all of our algorithms need the, the labels as the as the basically as the proxy to choose what is the nearby targets, what is the nearby features. So I so I guess if there's label noisy problem in this uh, in this task, then probably it will influence the performance of our techniques. Um, but in a um, but in a high but uh, in a high level speaking, for the imbalance imbalance regression problem, um, there are already some noises injected in the in the label space because first you have uh, the data imbalance problem, and if you are trying to to make the problem as uh, to make the targets into different bins, you are kind of introducing the quantization errors already. So I believe if there's already a large portion of data that is uh, already corrected labeled, then the model by our algorithms should be able to learn the continuity because we already enforce this prior in the algorithm design. So if the model is able to learn the continuous feature space, then by definition, it should work uh, at least better than the Valina algorithms. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, hi, you draw. So let me add another question. So about the, um, like the, so, so I heard that most of the medical people, they are kind of the very con, con, uh, like, contr like con contr controversial or like uh, uh, con conserve the um, like technique from the AI field. Um, so like in your opinion, like how, like how conservative they are and how to how do you persuade them to like to use your method like how how many accuracy you need to persuade them yeah thanks uh thanks for the great question yeah this is indeed uh a gap between our uh 
AI background people and the uh, people in the medical field. So, um, so yes, uh, I agree that uh, in the in the medical or health application field, people are pretty, uh, pretty sensitive about the the AI method. Like you are developing a black box uh, AI model for for predicting the human diseases or other metrics that are pretty important. Um, so in our case, um, probably I can jump to the uh, to the slide that uh, have the. So I, I believe the first uh, the first thing we need is we need a large number of samples to 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 validate. So uh, as I said, uh, our in in our paper we we sorry uh, let me first jump to that slide. Mm. So about, yeah, so this one. Um, so in our paper, we actually collect a very diverse data sets from multiple medical institutions. And our data set is kind of like a, a large combination of 10 different studies. So, so this, I think this is pretty important and, uh, and necessary to provide a large and diverse data sets in the first place to convince people that you are actually doing experiments over a very diverse and representative population. So the, so the data is the first key. And then you probably need very in-depth analysis and experimentation. So I believe here, um, even though our accuracy is kind of like around 90% AUC, um, in, the, in order to make it deployable or usable by the doctors, uh, you probably need even higher or even perfect accuracy. So that's what doctor would expect because they don't want to take risk on real patients, right? So, so in this case, um, the, the better accuracy you can get uh, would be the most desirable case. And um, probably for this type of works, you still need to do very in-depth analysis that cover different aspects. And, um, and uh, I think most importantly is cover a, a large diverse population. Okay, thank you. And I guess now you have another question, right? Oh, maybe no. Sorry, I cannot unmute myself just now. Uh, hi, Yuju. This is Liang Li. Okay, my first question is um, regarding the a few studies that you have done before uh, i think they are perfectly uh, fit into this question like um, i have seen a few of your works before like the long tail uh, regression problem uh, i'm quite interested like how mm, how did you fit them so nicely in this study i'm wondering like whether they are just designed for this study your prior works oh yeah Thanks, uh, thanks, Liang Yi, for your question. Yeah, this is actually a pretty good question. I was also talking this to to Kaiyang and uh, Jin Kang uh, before the talk, and yes, and the, the answer is yes. So, so the so the actual the actually the imbalance regression problem, we, we when we are designing this problem, we are actually motivated by this data set. So as I said, uh, we observed that because we want to predict the the severity of the the severity score of the patients. And if we actually, when we plot out the, the, the label distribution, we find it is it's very imbalanced and it's most concentrated for the controls and spread, spread out of the spectrum of all the PD patients. So this just motivates us to design this machine learning problem. And in turn, the algorithm we developed in turn benefits this PD uh, severity prediction problem. Yeah, so it's actually originated from this real problem. Well, that's a big project. Yeah, and it's very exciting to see how this particular uh, real world problem can be formulated into a neat mathematical questions. It's beautiful. Okay, my yeah, second thanks. question is, um, I believe this is a progressive study, right? It's not a retrospective. And, 
yeah, just go back. And, and what challenges do you see uh, in uh, in all this kind of uh, progressive studies in terms of uh, a machine learning problem? Uh, and how can we tackle that? Yeah, yeah, this is a very good question. Thanks. Um, yeah, I agree. This is a pretty progressive uh, study because um, because first we want to observe the uh, we want to observe the the severity changes over time uh, and also over populations. So I feel the first problem we can think about is kind of like modeling as it as a multi-domain problem um, because uh, we have uh, we do we do test it from. We do test it from like uh, multiple institutions here, but uh, this is far from representing the whole population over the world. So still we have the domain generalization problem. I believe this is an inherent problem in all of the healthcare applications because you want to generalize, you want your, you want your model to generalize to uh, any unseen hospitals or institutions. Uh, the population visiting that in institution. So I believe this is an inherent problem. I believe machine learning problem, machine learning people should work on. And another problem I believe is continual learning should be, uh, should also be of great interest because uh, in this kind of healthcare problems, you're kind of like receiving data over time. You're not receiving a static data set, but you're, you're receiving data in a stream, streaming manner. So patient patient status can change over a year or over two years, but you are still receiving the same data, like from the same hospital for the same patient. But your model might want to adapt to these uh, changes over time. So I also believe like continual learning should or lifelong learning should also be pretty important in this uh, real world, this kind of real world applications. And um, and to name a third one, I believe uh, uh, the the fairness or robustness uh, should also be of interest. Like one view of the fairness or robustness is the problem I study, which is the data imbalance problem. Um, this is a pretty clear one because when you directly visualize your data set, you can see there's like very high bias in the label space itself. But there could also be like other fairness problem like um, like a different population, different sub subpopulation problem. Like you, you, you might train on a data set that consists of uh, like a white men or like elders, but you also want your model to generalize to other populations like uh, uh, probably like a black woman and uh, younger people. Yeah, so I, yeah, so this kind of fairness and robustness problem should also be uh, kind of addressed. And yeah, so far I can think of these three directions. And yeah, we can discuss it more, more yeah, offline you. if you're interested. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, this is quite interesting because, um, you know, there are many hospitals and I, I don't think that the eight one presented here are representative enough to be applied in real world applications and we really need to do more. And um, okay, to save everyone's time, I, I will propose my last question and we will keep this discussion offline later. Okay, my last question is, um, after this study, uh, the doctors, I mean, um, the clinicians choose to use or use not this, um, this, uh, let's say this algorithm and why do they opt in or why do they opt out? I see, yeah, this is a good question. So um, yeah, so our collaborators actually span from different medical centers. And um, I think the, the reason they opt in to, to develop such, to, to work with us to, de to develop such an AI model is because there's some there there is intrinsic problems or intrinsic challenges in in the PD field basically for the diagnosis or the progression tracking. So as I mentioned in the earlier of this talk, 
um, currently there's no actually no effective biomarkers for PD diagnosis. And currently for all of, uh, I believe most of these uh, neurological diseases, because they are progressing in a very slow manner. So when they're diagnosed in the clinic, they usually develop, the disease uh, usually develop for tens of years. So when they're diagnosed, basically they're already in a pretty medium or late stage. And this prevents the, the early uh, like medication or therapies that could prevent it from progressing uh, so fast. So this is an intrinsic challenge in the field and people are trying to discover new biomarkers rather than those based on just observations from those clinicians. So I believe this should be the biggest motivation. They, they are kind of collaborating with us. Yeah. It looks like the only viable solution at the early stage to detect the PD, am I right? Um, I would not claim that large, but I, I would just say like this seems to be a promising direction. Yeah. Interesting. And why do they opt out if they do? Uh, uh, yeah, I think that's also an interesting problem. So, uh, so, so you know, like different doctors, they, they can have different views and uh, some of them, yeah, although I have to, I have to, uh, I have to say that although we have some initial promising results, but the results are actually far from satisfactory because in these applications, you're dealing with actual patients. So you want your model to be as accurate as possible, like 99% AUC or even 100% AUC. So that means um, our model is kind of like a very initial one that um, proof of concept that this, this AI model and this source of signals can work, but it's far from being really developed in the hospital or in the clinic to replace the doctors. So that's why probably some doctors would not believe this uh, early stage research. Mm. But I believe this should be a pretty new and uh, promising directions to explore more. And yeah, and I would say it's more kind of like a research rather than a directly deployable product. Yeah, yeah, I agree. This is pretty interesting. Okay, thank you, Yujie. Let's keep the other questions offline. Yeah, thanks. Thank, thank, thanks for the question. So any, any more questions from the audience? You can raise your hands, not physically, but by uh, clicking the raise hand button, yes. Uh, let me add another one. I, uh, I, I, uh, so I found that so uh, usually your um paper, your academic paper, uh, maybe so. So easy to read paper or other like, uh, machine learning paper. They are working on like conservation uh, conservation data sets. But your nature um publication, you are working on, I would say, cyclo something like that, right? So. Um, the conclusion between them, they are nine, right? So even though they are different domain, they're different kind of data. Yeah, I see, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jingang, you know, for the question. Yeah, actually, this is a very uh, good question. So uh, yeah, so for the machine learning papers or algorithms we're testing, we mostly testing on the uh, images or uh, like NLP tasks, which are very prevailing in the ML or CV task, uh, CV problems. Although for the regression task, we also imbalance regression paper, we also test on the healthcare data set. And um, I believe the conclusion should hold regardless of the data source, um, because we here we don't assume any um, kind of the input modality, right? Um, it can be one dimensional, which is the breathing signal. It can be two dimensional, which is like images or uh, even videos, I don't know. Um, but uh, I think for those algorithms, they're kind of like operating in the later stage of the network, which is, uh, for example, in the imbalanced regression case, we operate on the feature layer and the final loss function. And for the uh, multi-domain learning case, we are designing a, a loss 
uh, a final loss function based on the intermediate feature map. So, um, so yeah, so I believe uh, it should work uh, across different uh, input modalities and different tasks. Uh, yeah. yeah, and indeed, uh, because the machine learning papers we show on the contribution task, but we also apply this um, these algorithms to this uh, medical data set and it turns out to work pretty well. So I believe it's, it should be generalizable to different modalities. Yeah, yeah that, that makes sense. And that, that also kind of answers Guang Song's question. Uh, can, you, you didn't try many other layers because you want to generalize the modality, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks yeah, for the yeah, reminder. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So uh, any more questions from the audience? You can raise hands or perhaps I think we are approaching the end of the talk. So just uh, one more question from, from my side. And um, so I can see indeed there are many problems that need to be addressed before uh, before we actually go into the product line, right? By commercially, commercially this, uh, commercializing this technology. So, uh, so is there, what do you think is the most, uh, the biggest challenge if we want to commercialize this te technology? Whether it's from the, uh, from the technical side or whether it's from the, uh, I don't know, maybe from the regulations from, yeah, from in terms of regulations. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Kyle, for this great question. Uh, uh, so I will try my best to answer this question, though probably this might not be uh, universally correct. Uh, so from my perspective, um, uh, to commercialize this kind of uh, like AI models, we probably still need to go through a pretty strict uh, process that uh, I think for in the US, they, 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 they need to go through the FDA approval uh, this process like to demonstrate you, you already apply this technology on some clinical trials and to see significant outputs. And uh, as, far, as far as I know, this step would take a, a certain amount of time, like uh, probably like several years to, to, to actually see the, 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 the outcomes. So I, I feel this process would be pretty like, um, restrictive and also this is this is to ensure that your model or your technology is indeed working uh, and on different populations and uh, yeah and the second point I, I feel is you still need to test it as rigorous as possible like test it on different populations test it on different ages test it on different uh like uh regions and with different devices so so yeah, so to because you, you don't want to make uh don't want to see the device might or the algorithm might fail under certain scenarios. So that might cause an even bigger problem. So I feel this step would probably take more time, like more engineering efforts. And uh, from the technical part, I feel um yeah, I'm not sure about technical part, probably um we still need to improve the performance, as we said, uh, to try to improve it uh, as accurate as possible to meet the real world uh, standards or the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And yeah, we, we need very high uh, accurate performance in order to satisfy you know, those lawmakers, right? So yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and we, we have just missed one question from Guangchong. Uh, Guangchong just uh, typed uh, one more question in the, Chat room. So he 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 asked. So how how to solve the sparse supervision problem? I see. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Gongsun, for the uh, for the question. So um, so to solve the sparse uh, supervision problem. Uh, so here we we don't uh, we didn't make this algorithm as a, as a single learning paper because this is pretty uh, domain specific. Uh, so the, sorry, let me go to that, uh, that slide first. Uh, uh, yeah, so here, I guess it's here. Right? Yeah, so basically we use a multitask learning uh, framework and uh, 
So here the details probably would be too much for this work. Uh, we can synchronize later to, uh, later offline, or you can directly read our paper. Um, basically, the high level idea is we want to because the supervision is pretty sparse. If we just use um, the the binary output or a single number to represent the, the the severity, so we want to match the the dense information in the input. So in the output side, we also introduce another task with, which is predicting the per second uh, brain activity, which is called EEG signal. And by reconstructing this uh, dense EEG signals, we are kind of regulating the network to actually learn the brain related information and the sleep related information to make the network, uh, uh, to make the network to fuse the knowledge about PD um, instead of about other like spurious correlations. So here we just introduce another auxiliary task, auxiliary dense output task um, to, uh, yeah, basically to avoid the, the sparse supervision problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, thanks. So, um, so I think uh, it's pretty much everything. So uh, any more questions from the audience? No, uh, so, so, okay. So uh, thank you everyone for attending this second episode of the talk hosted by the AI Talks. And thank you Yuzhe for giving such a wonderful talk. Um, and thank you everyone. So uh, we will see you next time. So bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.